Good day. Good day. Good day, everyone. Just in case you are following me for the very first time, my name is Brian Glaze Gibbs. And my story, the Brian Glaze Gibbs story, Beyond Lucky, is a true story of change and redemption. This is my ministry. How do I use my story to get it out there, to get the younger the generation to understand that, guess what? Do not be hoodwinked. Do not be tricked out of your freedom. Don't let nobody talk you into doing something that you really don't want to do. You know, peer association, peer pressure, very, very important. Peer pressure, when people are trying to pressure you to do things that you don't want to do, you know, if you don't want to do it and you know in your heart, in your mind, your soul, in your spirit that it's wrong, don't do it. Peer association, just because you hang out with a bunch of individuals, you know what, like I told you, I did the same thing that was knucklehead. That don't mean you have to do everything they do to be down, to be accepted. Today, what I'm gonna speak about is August 11. August 11, 1988, it was a Thursday when the United States government came, you know, with Operation Horse Collar, and they brought us all down. They brought us all down. So I'm going to get started. Agent arrested 30 in Fat Cat Gang. And it go like this. It's from the New York newspaper back then. And right now, I don't know whether y'all can really see it fully, but this is the article that I will be reading from. Okay, it go. New York. A three-state sweep against the New York-based drug empire of Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols delivered a stinging blow to $20 million a year ring and brought police closer to solving the killing of a rookie cop. Okay, days later, an enraged drug official say that burn killing changed the rules of the ball game and Thursday... The first fruit of the effort surfaced as 400 agents staged a raid in three states and arrested 30 people connected to the toughest of the new gang, including the relative of the fat cat of southeastern Queens. You know, sit back and think about it. L look what they just say. Here it is, 30 people. You know, I can remember getting that call. You know, it's a Thursday. I'm laying in the bed in South Carolina. My son, 10 days old. And when I get that call, like 6 o'clock in the morning, you know, you wipe the cold out your eye, see who this called me and why. So on the other end, the guy was telling me, look, man, they got this Cypress headquarters surrounded, surrounded with like law enforcement. You know, they got their machine gun. They got their heavy vests on. And you got, you know, I'm talking about SWAT, like trucks. And they got the whole facility to surround it. So he went on to say, hey, you know, I don't know if they're looking for you. Are they really looking for me? And even in his next breath, he's saying that, you know, words are circulating throughout that they found X amount of money, drugs and dead bodies. And listen, like, don't get me wrong. I've been on. A, I, I've been out of town because like I told you, my son was born. So I wasn't there anyway. So if they found a couple of dead bodies in the apartment, let's get real. Who keep dead bodies in the apartment? You know, even though that time I'm 24 years old. I'm 24, I want to be grown, um, thinking I'm tough, thinking I'm above the rim. But guess what, people? Nobody is above the law. Nobody is above the rim. I was out there. I was a career criminal. I was a piece of dog doodle. And yet and still, you know, I got a newborn. I'm thinking my life about to change. I want to be a family man. You know what? That was not going to case. That was not in my cards. Like, imagine, people, sit back and think about it. Imagine, like, you know, your family, you know, doors being kicked in. And you got all these guys coming in, like, you know, with a bulletproof vest on, machine guns. You know, I'm, I'm talking about tactful, like the military. And they throwing everybody out, out on the floor, out the bed, you know, escorting people out of their bed, into the street, halfway naked, and handcuffed, and arrested them. Tell me, how will you feel? How will you feel if you're responsible for your mother going to jail? If you're responsible for your father going to jail, your wife going to jail, your kids going to jail? How will you feel? I'm telling you, man, that was not a nice feeling. That was not a, a, a feeling that make you feel great on the inside. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read you some excerpt from my book, The Beyond Lucky. Okay, the Brian Glaze Gibbs story, Beyond Lucky. And right now, for those that want to order your copy, email me, Brian, B-R-I-A-N, G-I-B-B-S, 1201 at yahoo.com. Okay, here it is. Again, after the hit on rookie NY police, Edward Burns, enough was enough. And the federal government got involved and initiated 
Operation Horse Collar. You know what? They came together and they joined force and they initiated Operation Horse Collar. Okay? Um, the main reason, you know what I'm saying, they truly believe we had no respect for law enforcement and authority. Really, I hate to be sarcastic, but yes, we didn't have much respect for the law. We was criminal. First to hit on parole officer Brian Rooney, okay? And now the killing of a 22-year-old rookie police officer. Come on, enough is enough. Now you look at it, man, guess what? Who's next? Are you gonna go after the district attorney, U.S. attorney, the judge? Who's next? Who's next on that hit list? So those are things, like you said, you constantly, you sit back, you think about, and you wonder, like, what's going on? Like, what's next? Um, now, like I tell you right now, after I got that phone, you know what I'm saying, with my family, my security ended when I, my, my serenity ended when I was awakened bright and early Thursday morning. Operation Horse Collar was closing in on me. I was in bed with my wife and my 10-year-old son who was sleeping in his bassinet. Okay, the phone ring with an urgency as I answered the call, both sluggish and tired. It was one of my guys. His voice on the line sounded almost like a morning news flash. That feds, FBI, DEA, U.S. Marshal, and the effing NYPD. You know what I'm saying? Okay, here it is. They had the whole Cypress Hill houses blocked off. The area is surrounded with hundreds of law enforcement personnel stopping and checking IDs of everyone entering and exiting Cypress Project. The caller wanted to tell me that they had a fugitive warrant for my arrest and word on the street was that when they raided my apartment 4B besides drugs, money and guns, they discovered several dead bodies. At another time, they would have been at least $1 million in cash, 30 to 40 kilos of cocaine and 1 to 2 kilos of pure heroin and a hundred semi-auto Uzi and Tech 9 and handgun. I was now awake. This was supposed to be the time of my life. With a 10 day old mini me, I lay there for another moment thinking, okay, how? I thought I was smarter than my predecessor. I am glazed. This is not supposed to be happening to me. Not now. I hit the shower, trying to sort things out. I wanted to scream. My mind was racing, my life has seen like it was changing for the better, but now I was officially a fugitive, okay? My wife, unaware of the situation, came in the bathroom to remind me that my son had a doctor appointment and I needed to hurry up. You know, like I told you, man, that day in particular, I, I, I don't know, I was like, I guess on cloud nine or whatever, because even right now, as we proceed to take my son to the hospital that particular day, it's like when we got to the hospital, even when I was driving there, Anyone I see and look like a police car, a fed car, you know, I, I thought it was the FBI. Once I got to the hospital, you know, I'm seeing people walking around. You know what? I'm thinking everybody's feds. That's how paranoid that you get. And you know what? It's not a good feeling. You know, I reflect back upon my life. I reflect back upon everything I did. And now the moment of truth. Um, as my Cypress headquarters was being raided simultaneously, Fat Cat and Pappy was being transferred from the state prison to Brooklyn Federal Court. Cat mother and stepfather was being arrested in Besma, Alabama. Cat wife was being arrested in Virginia Beach. Okay, his sister, niece, and other associates were being apprehended in Queens and Long Island. Pappy mother, uncle, girlfriend crew was also arrested. Operation Horse Collar was moving at a full speed. That day, they arrested over 50 people except me. And like I told you, only reason they didn't get me because of the fact that I was not there. I was not in town that particular day. It, you know, literally, like, first of all, if they would have went to the Cypress address, I wouldn't have been anyway. I've been, I had co-ops in, like, you know, Queens. So I've been left, like, Brooklyn, New York. I've been left that area, period. But even now, as I became officially on the run, it was like one of those situations that my life, as I knew it, was over with. Um... As time went on, you know, you, you, you get an update. And I can remember later on that night, whereas like, you know, you're afraid to use the phone at the house. So I went a distance away from where I was residing at and I went to town and I got on a pay phone and I got my guys, I called my guys, they all together or whatever. And basically like they looking at the news and the news is showing them all type of like, the, you know, they're, they're, they're showing the whole event all over again. How these individuals, how the law enforcement got the, the project surrounded and how they arrested everybody else throughout the, you know, um, the states and out of town. So even right now is as my guys looking at that footage, they say, oh, gee, man, yo, Glaze, you know what? If you was there, I know what you would tell us to do. 
You know, with all the artillery we would have had, we would have told us to shoot it out. Okay, let's sit back and think about it. We're on a fourth floor. You got several windows and you got the door. Those are the only two ways in and out. And guess what? You talk about we surrounded by a small army. So to me, like I told my guys, opposed to me telling y'all guys to shoot it out, I would have been hoping that we all had on white boxes that I can take off our white boxes, our drawers, and hang it out the window to surrender. Because sometimes you have to count your loss and know when things is over. And at that present time, guess what, guys? I knew it then that my life that I knew was over with. Um, I knew our whole situation came to the end. And, you know, the more of the story, guys, listen, you know what? 24, I grew up too fast. I became Brian Glaze Gibbs by the time I was 24. Any crime that I committed was by the time from the 14 to 24 years. And sit back and think about it. What were y'all doing at 24 years old? Hopefully, y'all wasn't out there in the street doing knucklehead stuff like me. Hopefully, you know, you wasn't more or less like picking up the brick, throwing at the prison wall and waiting to go to jail or waiting for, you know, more or less like the morgue to come pick up your dead body. It's like life is more to that. And to me, like if you sit back and you watch my story and you listen to the words that come out of my mouth, I'm not trying to glamorize anything. I have plenty of remorse, plenty of regret. Crime doesn't pay. And if I can change, anybody can change. Follow me up. Follow me, Brian Glaze Gibbs, on my YouTube channel. Also, check out my Instagram channel, Brian Glaze Gibbs. And also, for a signed copy of my book, The Brian Glaze Gibbs Story, A True Story of Change and Redemption, email me, Brian, B-R-I-A-N, Gibbs, G-I-B-B-S, 1201 at yahoo.com. As I can say, crime doesn't pay. This is Brian Glaze Gibbs. Um, this is only the beginning. Um, this is my ministry. I'm trying to get my story out there. I'm trying to get these kids to understand what we need to do in life. Do it right the first time. If I can change, anybody can change. One love. Part two coming soon.